What did God see in David that he did not see in Saul? What was so interesting about David, and we have uh, defined it, that God saw in David a heart willing to do his will. The bottom line is the heart of David, given a choice, he wants, he wants to follow God's will. But because he's human like us, he would find himself disobeying God left and right. But when he's confronted of his sin, we see the heart of David willing to do his will. In contrast to Saul, there was a time, the second offense of Saul, when he was rebuked by the great prophet Samuel, he was still interested in thinking about his image that he said to, he said to Samuel, yeah, I, I acknowledge my sin, but come with me. Come with me and honor me before the people. If you will not come with me, then the people will, uh, where's my honor? So he was still, still thinking of his honor rather than being contrite in his heart when he offended God. And on contrast with David, that's the beauty of the heart of David, that when he was confronted of his wrongdoings, he would not rationalize it, not even try to justify his action. He was contrite. He was repentant and he was submissive to God's will. So God saw in David a heart willing to do his will. And that is validated in the New Testament. I don't know if, you're, if you remember your, your book of Acts, when Paul was in the area of Antioch, when he was visiting one of the cities and he was asked to preach in the synagogue, and in the synagogue, he was talking to the Jews and he, and he reiterated to them and refreshed their, their memory about the story of God's redemption and God's promise to the land or to the, to the nation of Israel from the time of Moses down to the kings. And in that portion of his sermon, Apostle Paul validated our learning last Sunday. He said this in Acts chapter 13. After removing Saul, according to Paul, when he was uh, recalling the history of Israel to the Jewish people in the synagogue in that part of Antioch, he said he made, God made David their king. He testified, God testified concerning David, him. And I have found favor, or I have found David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. Look at that, how beautiful. I wish that when, every time God would look at us, he would look at us and say, you know, that, that man and that woman is a person after my heart. You know why? Because the heart of that man and that woman is willing to do my will. Look at the description of, of how God testified about David. David, son of Jesse, a man after my own heart. And then he added this line that validated our uh, lesson last Sunday. He will do everything I want him to do. So I wonder if our hearts are like that. Because Saul, given a choice, he would, he would not depend on God. 1 Samuel chapter 15 ended with a sad note. Samuel mourned for Saul. Why? He was part of the choosing of Saul. And the, the rejection of Saul as the king of Israel was like death to Samuel. He mourned for Saul. While the Lord grieved that he had made him king over Israel. In other translations, the word grieve is he regretted. Samuel mourned for Saul just like he died and he actually died from the perspective of Samuel as the great prophet, the, great, the last judge to rule the nation of Israel. Now before we jump into the passage that is very, very interesting today, I want you to join me to just have a glimpse of prophet Samuel. For all of you, for some of you have, who are not familiar about Samuel, Samuel the prophet is actually one of the greatest prophets in the time of Israel. He's the last judge. He functions as a prophet and as a judge. And Samuel, if you still remember your Old Testament or the First Covenant, he was that young boy, a product of a prayer by mom. His mom was Hannah, who was barren. And the Lord answered the prayer of Hannah, and lo and behold, Samuel was conceived. <clears throat> and when Samuel was born, Hannah, his mom, prayed in a prophetic way. And one of the lines in that prayer defines the role of, of this prophet named Samuel. So allow, allow me to show it to you. That line that defines the role of this prophet is this. He said, he will give, referring to his son, uh, Samuel, he will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Samuel was instrumental in anointing the first king, which is Saul. But here, Samuel would learn that that was not the, per, that was not the anointed of God. And we will learn today that even a prophet like Samuel, great as he was, 
acknowledged to be one of the greatest judges in Israel. Yet Samuel, in our text today, would learn something very, very valuable. The, the chapter that we're going to read is actually Samuel learning something. Because as a prophet, as a human being, he could also make mistakes, like, just like many of us today. Okay, so the title of our conversation, if you may allow me, is God's Anointed King. Now, he thought it was already Saul. That's why, that's why he came to Saul and said, oh, if, if you only had obeyed the commandments of God, he could have made your, your throne an everlasting throne. So here, Samuel would learn the identity of the anointed king of God. Now, I want you to pay attention very carefully. For all of us, for the sake of our study, we have already identified the name of this person by the name of David. But if you are reading Samuel for the first time, you would notice that the name David was not even mentioned from chapter 1 until chapter 16, verse 13. I want you to join me and assume that we don't know this man. Okay? We, we have no clue as to who is this guy. In chapter 13 of Samuel, God said to Saul that because you have disobeyed me, I have started seeking for a man after my, goat, my, my own heart. And that's, that man's identity was not revealed. Even Samuel before chapter 16, verse 13, he had no clue, he had no idea as to who is this man. It's only in this passage that he will discover and personally meet the man after God's own heart. So I want you to erase muna in your mind the identity of this anointed king. When I was growing up as a Christian, I don't know for some of you, one of the first things that is so weird that I heard was the word anointing. When I was new in the church, I heard those terms and sometimes used inappropriately or sometimes used or misused or being abused in the term because there are, I heard, I heard, I heard comments like, Oi, you respect that man because that man is anointed. There are so many things about, oh, that person is anointed. Oh, the reason why he's doing like that because he's anointed. So I was like, what, what do you mean by anointing? So for the sake of all of us to have, to have a proper understanding of the word anointing, so what is anointing? Anointing is a term especially used in the Old Testament, but it's also uh, visible in the New Testament. The word anointing is a ceremony or an action uh, related to a appointment or when choosing someone for a specific task. Not every loyalty in those ancient Near Eastern countries or the Mediterranean world, world not every country is like Egypt that they would anoint their king. Actually, it's the opposite. In Egypt, it's the Pharaoh that would anoint his leaders. But in Israel, God practiced this in those times. And anointing with oil, it usually goes with oil, is attested throughout the Old Testament as a sign or as a gesture of consecration. The word consecration is similar to the word holy, which means being set apart. So let me explain it to you. Consecration means when you designate a certain thing or a certain person for a specific and a particular, particular use or purpose. Consecrate means you mean you set apart. The word holy means setting apart. And in those days, anointing were not only done in, through people or to people, to specific people like priests, kings, and prophets. Anointing in those days, especially in the context of Israel, was also used anointing equipments and things. So let's say in the time of Israel when they were marching in the wilderness, they don't have uh, speakers like this or instruments like that. But if they had those things, they would anoint it, means consecrate those elements and equipments for God's use only. And anointing has two dimensions, the private and the public dimension of anointing. There is usually this kind of closed session of an anointing session, like a private thing, small scale, but there is also a, an inaugural enthronement or consecration done in public. So when it is referred to a king, or a royalty, there is a private uh, anointing and there will be a public enthronement or inauguration of the kingdom. Now today, in our text in 1 Samuel chapter 16, in this portion of the passage, we will see the private session of the anointing of the king of Israel, the God's anointed king. So 1 Samuel chapter 16, 1 to 13. And the lesson I have learned that I want to share with you today is this. When God anoints his servant... He empowers him for service. The outcome is always for the divine service. You were not, we are not anointed just for pogi points, for our own benefit. The anointing is always for a reason 
that a purpose may be accomplished, which is actually a divine purpose. Later on, we will see and understand the implication of David's anointing for us believers in the new covenant. What is this anointing in relation to us today as a church? Now, join me as I uh, unpack before you chapter 16. It started with this, Samuel. The Lord said to Samuel, because Samuel, after chapter 15, went back to his hometown, Ramah, and mourned. The Lord said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul since I have rejected him as a king over Israel? He cannot move on. Depressed. Because he was part. When you anoint kasi someone, you're pledging your loyalty, your support, and your allegiance to that person. Remember the prayer of his mom? That he would help his king and his horn and anoint. That is the purpose of his birth. So he was so down and he was so depressed that he could not move on. And the Lord had to visit Samuel and said, Samuel, get up. How long will you mourn? Move on, Samuel. Stop mourning. What a rebuke from God. And then God said to Samuel, fill your horn with oil. Come on, Samuel. Stand up. We have another mission. Stand up, Samuel. Be on your way. I am sending you to Jesse of Bethlehem. I have chosen one of his sons to be king. Come on, Samuel. Go, I have a mission for you. And later on, you will learn that this mission is a covert mission. It's a secret mission, and it's really interesting. But before that, let me pause for a while, and I want you to pay attention to Bethlehem. Now, listen very carefully. Go to this place in Bethlehem, Samuel, for you are going to be you are going to see and anoint the chosen one to be the king, the next king of Israel. Fast forward thousands of years from Samuel time, maybe a thousand years, in the same town in Bethlehem, Magi's from the east would visit to pay tribute to a new king. Do you think that's coincidental? Coincident? No, 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 no. Because David and Jesus Christ comes from the same tribe. When Adam and Eve fell to sin, God said to Eve, don't worry, Adam, one of your seed, one of your offspring, he will crush the head of the serpent. A promised seed will come from you who will be the victor over the serpent. And in the 12 tribes of Israel, the tribe of Judah was chosen by God to be the seed bearer, the bearer of the seed of the Messiah. And David from Ruth, who married Boaz, a Moabite, married this person from Bethlehem. And, and if you will notice in, in, in Matthew chapter 1, one of the, one of the great, great grandfather and parents of, Dave, of Jesus Christ is David. Jesus is the son of David that was promised in the Old Testament. So I was, I, was, I was really interested and excited when I came to this portion of, wow, Samuel would not even realize that when his visit to Bethlehem to anoint the new king of Israel, that was actually a foreshadow of what is going to happen down the road, thousands of years down the road, that there will be and ultimately the anointed king will be born in the same town. Oh, Bethlehem Ephrathah, sabi ng prophet, you're so little, you're so small, and yet from you, the Messiah will come. When I was reading the story of this private session of anointing, is that if you will notice, as I have invited you, we don't know who is this man. Samuel had no idea or clue as to the identity of this man that was chosen. And you know why? God is really a, an interesting God, sometimes funny, because he, if I was God, I would tell Samuel right away, go to Bethlehem, find the family of Jesse, and look for his son David. Why cover the identity at this moment? Why not disclose everything to Samuel? Prophets in the Old Testament, they are known to be exact and specific. They are known to be exact. They know what to do. But at this moment, because I believe in my heart, God is going to teach Samuel some valuable lessons for all of us to learn. So look at Samuel. Heavy-hearted depressed. Get up, Samuel. Go. We have another mission. Don't be sorry about yourself. If you are part of the failed anointing in Saul, we have another king, the anointed one. So Samuel, get up. Go. But Samuel said this. Look at this. Samuel said, how can I go? Saul will hear about it and will kill me. Wow. Did you see how, how Samuel really knew Saul? as the real person, praning yon. This is a very difficult mission. What if God would tell you, anak, go home to the province, in your province, 
and anoint the new barangay captain. I have already anointed the new barangay captain. And here you are. You know there's another barangay captain sitting there. And here you are trying to proclaim a new barangay captain. You're campaigning for another captain or another mayor. What would happen to you? In the same manner, Samuel said, Lord, are you sure he would find out that the great prophet Samuel is going to replace him and anoint a certain king? He would not only kill me, but we will put in danger the life of that person, whoever that person. Maybe Samuel is already curious. Who is this guy? Who is this man? The Lord said to Samuel, look at this. Take a heifer, take a heifer with you, and say, I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. When I reach that point, I press the panic button. Eh. Are you telling Samuel to lie? Look at that. Look at the verse. The word say is the crucial thing. Eh. If somebody asks you, say, sabihin mo lang you're gonna offer sacrifice to the Lord. Is God telling Samuel to lie? I don't think Samuel was lying when it, because he's going there to offer a sacrifice. You are going there to offer a sacrifice. So Samuel agreed. When you're there, the Lord said to Samuel, invite Jesse. I will show you what to do. You are to anoint for me the one I indicate. Sabi ni Samuel, ano ba yan? Suspense. Exciting. Eh? Si Samuel, walang kalam. Samuel has no idea. Samuel did what the, Lord, what the Lord said to him. When he arrived at Bethlehem, I was imagining, I was imagining Samuel was walking to Bethlehem, a small town. Maybe he has an entourage. And the news spread so fast. The prophet Samuel is coming. You know, in those days, when a prophet visit a town, dalawa lang ibig sabihin nun, good news or bad news. So, the elders of the town, these are the influential leaders, respected leaders, trembled. Look at that. Because in the Old Testament, in the first covenant, usually if there's someone who sinned in, the, in a province, on a city, or in a barangay, and there is a plague, everybody suffers. They trembled when they met him, and they asked, do, do you come in peace, great prophet Samuel? Did someone violate the Lord in our area that we did not know? That's my addition. Do you come in peace, sir? They were all shaking. And then, oh, what a relief. Yes, I have come in peace. I have come to sacrifice to the Lord. Wow. Consecrate yourselves and come to the sacrifice with me. Consecrate Jesse. He consecrated Jesse and his sons and invited them to the sacrifice as, as, as a guest of honor. Can you imagine if you're one of the leaders, what's going on? Why would he single out the family of Jesse? Somebody knock at the door of Jesse's house. Uh, Jesse, yes. Oh, yes, sir, yes. Sir, anong balita? Oh, Samuel the prophet, the great prophet is here. Ano nangyari? Mayroon, wala, wala tayong kasalanan. Mayroon lang party. Sacri- and he asked for you and your sons. You better go. They don't know what's going on. It's a covert operation. Only Samuel knew and very little lang kanya kaalaman because the Lord said, I will tell you when you're there. Remember, at this moment, the identity of the man after God's own heart is not yet revealed. So he invited Jesse and his sons. When they arrived, Samuel, look at this. I want you to pay attention carefully because most of the time, you miss, you are, we are misreading the text. When they arrived, can you imagine, you know, maybe there's a platform, maybe it's somewhere elevated because usually it's in a high place. Samuel, walang alam-alam si, si, si Jesse. Mga anak, bis kayo, ikaw maglagay ka nga ng short mo, yung pants mo. What's going on, dad? What's going on? I don't know. But we were cold. Everybody was like afraid. So when they arrived, Samuel, and maybe there was this interaction like, oh, Jesse, and introduce to me your son. As, as, sir, sir, this is my eldest. Remember, no one knows why Samuel was there. Here comes Eliab, the eldest. When they arrive, actually, they pass before Samuel. And look at this. I want you to pay attention to the word thought. Nothing was verbal. Nothing was audible. Only in the mind of Samuel, pagdaan ni Eliab. Mm, surely. He didn't say that, huh? He didn't say it. Surely the Lord's anointed stands here before the Lord. Now, I want you to watch out. Don't blink. Because this is going on in the mind of Samuel. Nobody knew what was going on, the purpose, the reason. The next verse was a lesson for Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, nothing is audible. This is just between God and Samuel. But the Lord said to Samuel, do not consider his appearance. Oops, it's revealed. 
Maybe this is the guy. Alam niyo problema ni Samuel? He did not learn from his past mistake. The same criteria that he saw from Saul, that is the Israelites' concept or template of a king because a king is always related to a warrior. You don't choose a king that is like as skinny as Pastor Boots. You choose someone that is really with a physique because someone that can lead you out of the battle and fight for you. A king is a warrior. I like this verse. God was teaching his prophet Samuel. God said, do not consider his appearance or his height. For I have refused him, rejected him. Look at the next line. The Lord does not look at the things man looks at. Man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then I have a problem. Who looks at the heart? Yes, you may have an implication of the heart, but the totality of the heart of man, none of us is able to see that. Most of the time, we're attracted to the smart one. This was all smart looking. No, I'm not against any smart. Don't just look at the outward appearance. I'm not saying the outward is, is not good or the outward appearance is not relevant. But also look at the heart. Because by nature, we human beings, ang tendency natin is always to measure the book by its cover. Even the prophet Samuel had to learn it the hard way. That's my problem. Because all of us are inclined to look at the appearance of a person. We are prejudiced and biased. That's our problem. Do not look at the outward appearance, but look at the heart. But I was imagining the face of Samuel. Sorry, Lord. But nothing was verbal. Nothing was audible. It was only happening between him. Wow, how, how, how beautiful the Lord would have an object lesson for his prophet. Sabi ni Eliab, nothing happened. Okay, okay, just go. Next, ikaw na. Huh? Anong gagawin ko? What will I do? Just pass. See, had passed him in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, maybe this is audible. The Lord has not chosen this one. Chosen for what? Samuel for what? He would not reveal. Thank you. Next. Jesse. Then she said, Shama, Shama, or whatever, pass by in front of Samuel. But Samuel said, nor has the Lord chosen this one. And you know, interesting in the Bible, after the third son, the succeeding son, they did not name him anymore. He didn't even bother to name the other four. Pass forward. Jesse had seven sons pass before Samuel. But Samuel said to Jesse, I don't know if it is like out loud or maybe saying to, Sam, to, to Jesse, the Lord has not chosen this. Now here's the, here's the most, it gets more interesting. Sabi ni Jesse, huh? For what? Uh, so the seventh son like, what? Okay, okay, okay. Pass to the other side. The next line. So he asked Jesse, are these all your sons? Are these all the sons you have? You know why he asked this? I was just imagining. This is a, just allow me to just imagine, okay? Remember, rewind. The people of Israel comes to Samuel. You are old, Samuel. Give us a new king, Samuel. You're outdated. You're obsolete. You are you lost your head, Samuel. Give us a new king. I don't know if this has an effect to Samuel. And here's Samuel. He was very specific to the commands of the Lord. You will anoint one of the sons of Jesse. And the seven pass, and none of them. Maybe something happening in the heart of Samuel. Am I really old? Am I losing my edge? Did I misheard God? Jesse, are you really Jesse? Yeah, I am Jesse. Oh, Bethlehem? Yes. Can I see your NRIC? Oh, yeah, you are. Are you the only Jesse? Yeah, I am the only one. Are these are your son? Impossible. Impossible. I heard. Eh. I heard. That one. Maybe he did not say to Jesse, but in his heart, he's struggling. I heard. Eh. The Lord specifically told me to go to and find Jesse of Bethlehem because one of his sons will be the next king of Israel. And if, are these are your sons? Positive. Oh, Allah, Allah, ma. I forgot the youngest. Look at Jesse here. Now, I want you to pay attention carefully. Are these all your sons, the sons you have? I'm oh, so sorry, sir. They're still the youngest. Oh, no. I forgot. Did you really forget? 
I know for me, it's very condescending because the Hebrew word for the youngest carries the idea of the small one, the insignificant. Imagine if the mayor of the town would come to your house to have dinner in your place and your parents didn't even bother to tell you or even invite you. Oh yeah, so sorry sir, uh, Samuel. The youngest, the Hebrew word is the smallest one, the small boy, the insignificant. Oh, I didn't even bother to call you because for whatever reason you're anointing, he won't even qualify. Oh, wow. Alam nyo, just pause for a while, huh? Si David, read his Psalms. In one of the sessions, the writings of David, he said, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Now, I want you to ask yourself, who are the enemies David was referring? In the context of Psalms 23, you anoint me, my head with oil and my cup overflows. It was in that situation when he said, you prepare a table before me. Oh, the youngest one. Jesse answered, but he's tending the sheep. He's stinky. He's dirty. I'm sh the youngest one. And he was surprised when Samuel said, send for him. We will not sit down until he arrives. Oh, wow. I can, I can imagine the faces of his brothers. What, David? I'm already hungry. I'm famished. And we will not eat until he arrives? The more nang gagagiliit sa ki David. I don't know how far was the pastures, the place where David was tending the sheep, but Samuel said, send for him. If it is just over overlooking, he could have called David right away. But it could be a distance to call David. Somebody has to fetch David. And David was just singing, the Lord is my shepherd. David, stop singing. What? He's, your father is calling you. For what? Come, David. But Samuel said, look at this. Pay attention carefully. Huh? Send for him. We will not sit down. We will not eat until that boy arrives. At this very juncture, Samuel, Jesse, and even the elders, whatever, even the brothers, they had no idea what was the reason why they were being summoned. No idea the identity of the man after God's own heart was not revealed. So nobody knows it's only between Samuel and God. Look at the next verse. So he sent and had him brought in. Look at the description of... Some of you will like the description of <clears throat> David. He was ruddy. And it's ready, reddish. He was ready, but look at this. Outward appearance is not, not a problem. It's not totally irrelevant. Look at this. He was with a fine appearance. Not so elegant, not so dramatic, pero fine appearance. With a fine appearance, then look at the next line. And handsome features. In other translation, he had the beautiful eyes. He had the beautiful features. Handsome, guapo si David. Mamula-mula. And this is I like. This is really I like. But I want you to pay attention. We can all miss it if you read this so fast. Then the Lord said, Rise and anoint him. He is the one. It's only after this verse, the identity of the David, the man after God's own heart, was revealed. Are you ready? So Samuel took the horn filled with oil. David doesn't even know and had a clue, why am I here? Just go, just go, just go. Why am I here? David with his sling, with his rod, his shepherd clothing, stinky. And then Samuel stood up. Look at David, secondary boy mid-schooler, maybe 10, 12, 15 years old. Look at this boy. I don't know what's going on in the heart of some. Is this the one? Is this the anointed king? Rise, Samuel. He is the one. Samuel obedient. Samuel, David faced Samuel. Samuel got the horn. Poured oil. Hey, what you, what, you, what you doing, guys? No, no, no. Samuel, without any words, 
pour the oil, anoint David in the presence of his condescending brothers. What? Why him? The oil was dripping in all his body. And look at the next line. From that day on, the Spirit, with a capital S, the Spirit of the Lord came upon, here comes the name, ta -da -da, officially introduced in the pages of history. The man after God's own heart, David. David's name was mentioned for the first time in this portion. His name will always be mentioned more than 1,000 times in the entire scripture, more than Abraham's name. You know why? Because the anointing of David is a foreshadow of the coming son of David. This is interesting. Came upon David in power. That's why I said when God anoints his servant, he empowers him for service. And this is, this is anticlimactic. Okay, see you. <laughs> and Samuel returned to Ramah. That's all? Okay. And Samuel faded in the history of Israel. Why? Because that was the turnover of the judge Samuel passing on the leadership. But he did not tell them that this anointing, ladies and gentlemen, you will see the new king of Israel. None of those. Even David was clueless. Even Jesse. But every time David would play his harp and would always recall, you anointed my head with oil. My cup runs over. But something happened to David that day onward, the Holy Spirit come upon David in power. And Samuel went back to Ramah. David went back to shepherding. Everything went to normal. But the sequel, next two Sundays, you will see the power of this boy. Because when God anoints, He empowers him. First, exciting. But puputuling ko na dyan. Exciting tayo eh, na? Exciting. Here's, I want you to learn about the, God, the Spirit of God. Just to give us some information. Because the next verse after that one, when the Spirit comes upon David, the Spirit departed from Saul. Because the Spirit in the Old Testament, in the First Covenant, was restricted to chosen leaders, not given to all, who were anointed, consecrated, for divine service. In the Old Testament, it was given, the Spirit, not it, the Holy Spirit, is given to selected people, chosen ones. And not all of that, it is also external. Notice that the Spirit of the Lord came upon David. And temporal. Because when Saul disobeyed God, the Spirit departed from Saul. If you read the Judges, Samson, it was, he was strong not because of his long hair, I used to think that Samuel's strength was based on his long hair. No. Read it carefully. The Spirit of the Lord came upon Samson and he became very strong. It is the Spirit of the Lord coming upon him. But the Spirit can also depart because it's temporal. But in the New Testament, praise be to God, in the time of Jesus Christ, when the Son of David finally appeared, those who put their trust in Jesus, the Holy Spirit is given to everyone. Remember the preaching of Peter in Acts chapter 2? What you see today is a fulfillment of the prophecy of Joel when the Spirit shall be poured unto all flesh. Wow, we are better than Samson. We are in a better place more than Gideon. Because the Holy Spirit, when the Holy Spirit resides and you believe in Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is indwelling you. Remember what the words of Jesus to His disciples in John 14? The Holy Spirit is with you, with you, with you, alongside with you but He will be in you. Read that in chapter 14. The Spirit of the Lord is with you. He's already there. He's leading them. He's guiding them. But, Jesus said, time will come. The Spirit shall be, He will be in you. Because the Spirit is not external to those who are in Christ. The Spirit is internal, indwelling, and it's permanent. 
He will never leave nor abandon us. Wow! This is beautiful! Even when I disobey, yes, even when we disobey, even when we sin, the Spirit doesn't leave you. When you are doing something wrong and you committed sin, and yung parang nilalagnat ka na parang hindi mo maintindihan, your, 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 uh, your heart is pumping like anything, like your heart is gonna explode because you're, you did something wrong and namumula ka na high blood ka hindi mo alam because the Spirit is grieving and is telling you that is wrong because He will never abandon because the indwelling Spirit in you stays with you, committed to lead you to finish the work of Christ. He who began a good work in you will be faithful. I am going away, Jesus said, but I will not leave you orphan. I'm sending someone, another like another one like me, another comforter who would lead you and guide you into all the truth, who would convict the world with its sin and justice and mercy. The Holy Spirit shall come. In Acts chapter 2, the Holy Spirit descended on the church. Beautiful. The term anoint. In the Old Testament, the term to anoint is Masha. And it's really interesting because that's where we got the anointed one, Mesa, Mesia, Mashiach, or the Messiah. Because the true anointed one is a pre-picture of the coming Jesus, the son of David, the son of David, whose government shall be upon his shoulder, whose name will be Wonderful Counselor, Everlasting Father, who is Emmanuel, God with us, because he came and became flesh, and we have seen his glory full of truth, grace and truth. David's anointing was a foreshadow of the anointing of Jesus. It's a private session. When Jesus was baptized by John the Baptist in the Jordan River, John was recording. He saw the heavens open, and the voice, this is my beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. And the Spirit descended as a dove. That was the foreshadow, the fulfillment of the anointing of Jesus. Private session. Because someday, when the inaugural, when Jesus Christ will come again, as the King of kings and the Lord of lords to assume rulership in His kingdom. Beautiful. Look at that. Look what was happening during the time when Samuel was anointing David. Little did he realize that that was a foreshadow of the coming, the son of David, who will finally sit on the throne. And don't be afraid because when God anoints someone, He empowers that someone. Kaya ko ba? Look at Gideon. Can I lead them? Can I be a deliverer? I am the least of my family. No worry, Gideon. The Spirit of the Lord shall come upon you. And you will win because the battle is the Lord's day, Gideon. Moses, send someone, God. I am not eloquent in speech. Who am I, Lord? Send someone. Don't worry, Moses. Because when God anoints, He empowers. Samuel, is this the boy? You know, he could have missed in his very eyes, the anointed king would pass before them and miss it. If, because his template of the coming king is based on appearance and height, the Israelites' template of a king. That's why I understand. Because down the road, when the son of David appeared in Israel, many people missed the very presence. They were walking with the Messiah and they missed it. Why? Because the appearance of Jesus did not pass the template. They were expecting someone else. Isaiah 53 said, there was no beauty in him. He was bruised for our iniquities. But the chastisement of our peace was upon him. By his stripes, Isaiah said, we are healed. There was no beauty to attract us. But when God anoints, He empowers. How are you today, my brothers and sisters? Don't feel intimidated if God is asking you to do something. Don't st stop wishing, I wish I was like Elijah. I wish I was like Moses. No, you're, we are actually far better than them 
because they don't have the scripture. They don't know the identity of the Messiah. We have the scripture today. We have the Holy Spirit today. The same measure of anointing given to the apostles was also given to us. While I was growing up as a young believer, I had this, I, we were taught the wrong way. That there are some people more anointed than you. Why? The Holy Spirit can be divided. He has 100% and we only have 60? No. The same Holy Spirit that entered Peter and Philip is given to everyone who put their faith and trust in Jesus. The difference is our hearts. The church is God's anointed community. We are anointed because the Holy Spirit resides. Don't you know, Corinthians, that you yourselves is the temple of the Holy Spirit because the Holy Spirit dwells in you. The church, we in Singapore, we are indwelt. The Holy Spirit has anointed us as a community for what? To fulfill our mission on earth. Every believer in Christ has been empowered for service through the indwelling Holy Spirit. The difference between you and me and Philip and Stephen and them is a heart willing to do His will. But we have the same anointing. Don't ever be fooled by teachings that just not everyone have the same anointing. We all have the same. We are all baptized into one baptism. Paul said. And look what God said in Acts 1.8 as we close. Stop thinking of other power, the political power that you're assuming to have. He said to his disciples, but there's another power that will come upon you. When the Holy Spirit shall come upon you, you will receive power. Look at that. When the anointing is there, the empowerment goes with it. You shall receive power when the Holy Spirit shall come upon you. And you will be my witnesses. That's the mission, mga kapatid. The version of Matthew is that you go into all the world. I have given the authority in heaven and on earth. Go. The mission is go. The church, go. That's the mission. Go into all the world and make disciples of all nations for my name's sake and baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Here in the version of Luke, you will be my witnesses telling people about me everywhere in Jerusalem, in all the provinces of Judea, in Samaria, and the ends of the earth, in Singapore, in the Philippines, in down under, in Europe, Europe, in up north, everywhere you go, your mission is to bear witness. The Spirit has already been given. When God anoints, He empowers us for service. David was chosen to rule the nation of Israel. We believers today are anointed to fulfill God's mission. So here's my challenge. And our takeaway is when we God, when God anoints us, he empowers us for service. Therefore, let us be God's anointed servants. It's a matter of acting on it. Be the being. Be the, don't try to be the light. Be the light. You are already the light. You are the light of the world. What we need to do is just be. Live it out. Respond, own it. Realize what God has given to us, the anointing. And how do we do that? By fulfilling our missions.